All right. Oh, we're live. Excellent. Hey, camp followers. I am very, very happy to have a really, really dear friend of mine with us tonight. So I went to university with this guy. So if we have a few little in-jokes throughout, I do apologize. Just can't have to help ourselves. But he's done amazingly well. Like I'm massive bow down to Dr. Tom Harcourt Brown. Works at Bristol University. Um, senior lecturer in neurology. Just the, the, clinic, the clinical lead, the head of the Department of Neurology. The head of the department. Okay. Well, then I feel this big now. <laughs> so um, what we hope to do today is we're going to deal with some, some misdiagnoses because I'm just going to let him introduce himself, tell you, tell you a little bit about himself. Then I'm going to tell you why I've been desperately trying to get hold of him for this live. So first of all, tell us a little bit about, about yourself. Yeah, so as Han said, uh, Han and I trained together um, quite a while ago, and I then worked in practice for my parents, who were both vets, for three years after we graduated, and then went back to Cambridge to do some training to do a neurology residency, and then in 2010 started uh, the neurology department at Bristol University, and I've been here ever since, um, building up the department. Hey? You started the department. Oh yeah, there was no yeah no neurology at Bristol till me, and then Holy yeah. Man. So now there's well, now there's eight or nine of us. So uh, yeah, so it's quite a big department. So we see a lot of cases each year, and so some of the stuff, um, yeah, Han and I were we had a good chat, didn't we, about where this could cross over? I think uh, particularly neurology is a very worrying. Um, it's a very worrying discipline for people when their own when their animals have got neurological problems they're really very worried about it but there's a lot of things that we can actually treat and make better and some of the things that we would talk about tonight yeah 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 and I think I'll be fair to say it's worrying for vets as well because often the clinical signs look pretty bad mm. I was going yeah I know they're not working very well but I'm okay um, no you're right and I think that the thing about that is that the the signs that they show reflect the part of the nervous system that's affected not how badly mm -hmm. affected it is so exactly like you say they can look really broken you know they can't walk they're rolling over but it's only a it'll be a tiny bit of the nervous system that's going to get better so it's quite a good discipline i enjoy it a lot because i we make we watch a lot of dogs get better that we're going to get better by themselves we we help a lot of dogs get better and so it's yeah. quite a good um yeah it's really good fun yeah but it's quite scary so we're going to mm. try simple partly for my benefit so let me tell you the story so you can see where we're going with this. So we were both at a conference called BSOVA and we we're walking down the canal path and we bumped into each other. And Tom just happened to say to me, do me a favour, Hannah, please, can you start talking about peripheral neuropathies? Because we are having too many that are coming to us with the owner believing that the dog is in pain because it's lame. It's got funny gait, it's not walking very well. And they tend to be on quite a high dose rate of drugs, so multiple drugs, high levels, because they're like, well, it must be pain, it must be pain. Give them more pain relief, more pain relief. And actually, it's not painful. So that's where we're going to start. Help us with this. And what, what am I trying to say? So I think, yeah, it's good. Well remembered. And that was, uh, yeah, I, uh, we, it was, it was, the conversation started by finding that when I, uh, when I came to sort of train in neurology, it was a different viewpoint that I got to a lot of old dogs that I used to see in practice. So we would certainly see a lot of old dogs, like I think everyone's very familiar with probably on these webinars of old, particularly retriever breed dogs that look really slow. Their owners would report they were having difficulty rising, not really running, being very slow at walking. And the main worry for a lot of these people was their dogs were really painful. And I would diligently examine them and look for them to be painful and think well look their hips aren't very good they can feel their elbows aren't very good and we would start them on non steroidals metacam rimadil things like that and uh, find they didn't really respond and and i think that was and they didn't really do very well and people would be very worried their animals are very painful and i think i didn't have a better explanation and so then going back to do more training and seeing more of these dogs and getting more familiar with what goes wrong when the nervous system's not working um became quite obvious that uh, this group of dogs to me fitted very well with what we call neuropathies so diseases of the nerve so of the generalized nervous system and it's been well recognized for a long time that some older dogs just get 
their nerves not working very well. And the most common way that we see it or we're most familiar with it is if they get laryngeal paralysis. So they stop being able to breathe normally, their bark changes. And this is quite a common disease in older dogs. Um, one of the reasons is that that nerve that goes to the larynx has a strange route from the brain into the chest, back up to the larynx. So it's the longest nerve in the body. And if there's a disease affecting the nerves, it makes the body finds it hard to maintain the end of the nerves, the longest bits of the bits that die first. So we know that there's a disease in older dogs where their larynx stops working very well and sometimes they get mm -hmm. surgery for it. But my old supervisor at Cambridge and the department there also kind of asked the question, well, if this nerve's affected, are other nerves affected in the body too? And found that dogs with laryngeal paralysis often also have slow nerve function to all their limbs as well so they'll be slow at walking they'll be a bit weaker because their muscles aren't being maintained quite normally because their nerve supply is compromised and then as i said as we i went through my training and look at these dogs i thought well actually maybe now there's a population here of dogs where their nerves their legs aren't working very well and it hasn't actually affected their larynx yet so that's kind of like uh, laryngeal paralysis dogs but they haven't got the paralyzed larynx yet they're just weaker on their limbs and we then started to see owners they'd be bringing their dogs to them and that it made sense to me very much then that you look at these dogs and they would have difficulty rising they'd be slow at walking and now that I was examining them having been trained better in my neurological exam it'd be pretty obvious that actually their nerves weren't working and you look at it and say actually no this is a neuropathy this is um, these dogs can't move their legs properly because the nerves aren't working very well and the really reassuring bit for me with those was that it's just not a painful disease it's just not a, a diff it, it, it's not a disease we can cure it's not a disease that um we can we can reverse the the progression but it does mean that they don't need to be on all these all these medications they don't need to have people worrying the particular worry that their dog's really painful and that they're leaving mm -hmm. it really painful and they just don't know and so that was really nice and, and I remember a couple of even you know friends of mine's dogs that I'd watched get old and being able to say to their you know their parents you know Look, this is this is fine this is going to be okay you don't even need to do anything particularly different just look after them as they're getting older it's part of natural aging for, for a dog in a way yeah so in that case we'd be thinking more about protecting them from harm so you'd still mm. be stabilized to lift to support to help them around the obstacles of the home etc yeah i think nowadays i think um i have now worked with a really strong uh rehab and physio department here at bristol and i have to say that my feeling about that disease is that once that you've made that diagnosis it, clearly it, that's the role is for physio to try to maintain yeah. The muscle mass they've got and reduce the loss of muscle mass that's gonna that they're gonna have because what's happening to the nerves in these in these um degenerative neuropathy cases is that the nerves are dying back so the bit of muscle that they were innovating isn't hasn't got a nerve supply so it can't contract but other nerves around it will try to innovate that muscle as well and repair that damage so there's a slow yeah. progression and what we tend to see i think with these dogs is although it might take several years as the disease is going on you might need i don't know a million muscle cells to work normally um and you might have had 10 million at the beginning so but they're slowly being lost it's only when you drop below that critical number that they start to get really weak so if you can slow down that progression with physiotherapy i think it's probably very useful yeah yeah definitely okay so that leads really nicely we're not going to do it like vets learn because i can remember being terrified at uni where you just get a list of like the pathophysiology, then a list of all the diseases that's possibly there, clinical signs, you're just like rope learning. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna talk straight at how can we tell if there is pain or no pain? And let's use a case example. So we're gonna have a hefty golden retriever. He's gonna be called Fred. And he's really, really mean. <laughs> he's <laughs> comes in and he's what, got quite what's his name? Freddy, he's Fred. Freddy Redmayne. What? Freddie, 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 Freddie. Yeah, okay. Um, and he comes in and he's got, you know, slightly drunken back legs and his tail's a little bit limp and swishy and he maybe catches his toenails a little bit, but he doesn't seem bothered by it. And he comes in and your brain's going, right, are you a dog that's got hip pain or stifle pain or lower mm. back or a dog that's got motor deficits? You know, mm. deficits. So what do you do? So that's a good one. And I think that the, um, I think, uh, let me 
try to see how to answer that. Right. So, yes, they've often got joint disease. So you're trying to sort of say you've got a dog that you know has got joint disease, but you're wondering, could there be another neurological cause for it as well? Um, you painted a picture of a big retriever that was a bit wobbly on its back end to me actually with air with it and also with it dragging its legs there's a couple of things that would always alert me uh, to a neurological problem so dragging a leg is always neurological so if an animal is not picking its foot up enough and it's dragging the top of its foot on the ground it's wearing its claws that's always neurological so so straight away that would be no matter what orthopedic disease they've got there's a new there's a neurological disease as well so it's very easy that one so it's quite helpful it's a bit difficult when you when they're they're scuffing their foot so they're not dragging it they're sort of scuffing it down that 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 uses orthopedic that's usually not them them not wanting to flex the limb quite as much but if they're dragging yeah. if they're dragging uh it's, it's neurological and so the way i would sort of say to um the students is that what we try and if a dog isn't walking normally I'd look at it and just ask a few questions to myself which is firstly would I stop and look at this dog in the park if I walk past it so is it normal or not normal and then when I think it's not normal I'd think uh which legs is it that's affected is it all four legs is it one leg is it just the back legs because that helps me know where I need to start looking um but the next bit is I look at and think is it lame or is it not lame and so if they're by, by that I mean if they're lame so they're limping, they're putting, they're not putting their weight on the leg very much. It's an orthopedic cause. If they're not lame, so as in anything else, then it should prompt you to do a bit of a neurological exam on the dog as a vet. So that that should be how you'd think. And the most the most reliable tests that you've got are probably things that um, the guys look at this talk may well have seen their vets do, or the vets that, which is like the a paw placement test where you turn the top of the paw over onto the ground and see how quickly the dog replaces it or a hopping test where you'd support the dog's weight and try and get it to just to hop on 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 one leg because um and those are the ways that you can conf really screen for a neurological disease because although you might need to do more tests if you find those abnormal um finding that poor placement and that hopping abnormal is a good guy that there's a neurological disease so going to your point a bit there about freddie what do we call him freddie redmayne the fat golden yeah, retriever the so and he um and so he comes in and so I, I say i'd watch him walk and then the big bit of my neuro exam would be those poor placement and and hopping tests and they are things that are unfortunately a bit easy to get wrong with your interpretation you can make mm -hmm. dogs look abnormal when they are actually normal um it's less common that you miss. It's less common that they are abnormal and you make them look normal. If you see, I mean, you can you can think that it's wrong when it's actually okay. It's your testing that's that's wrong. Yeah, so, I think I'm 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 so kind of like scared of missing things. I think sometimes I overinterpret. Yeah, and that's much more common. I think actually, it's if if most times when people think they're normal, they're normal. That's what I found, mm -hmm. and it's you almost always because when they're abnormal, it's usually so obvious that they're abnormal that it's it's fine there's no mystery about it so there's a there's a there's clearly normal animals hang on there's clearly normal animals and there's clearly abnormal animals it's the bit in between that's quite difficult and that gray area is quite hard but i must say a lot of times vets will send us things that say i don't know if this is abnormal or not and i'll do it and i'll say i don't know if this is abnormal or not either and then that's fine and then which is and i think i always think if the vet was here i'd say because the students are always saying this you know or other specialists in other departments i say i don't know and i'll say but you know but it, and then you try and think your way through well if it's abnormal what am i missing if it's normal what am i missing and if there's nothing dangerous on either list it's okay just to wait and watch one of the rules i have is that if i don't know what to do i'll make sure the animal's very safe and as in there's nothing life-threatening and then i'll usually do nothing because most of the diseases that we're worried about are progressive because mm -hmm. and so what what feels so one of the answers for for freddie there is if you don't know if it's neuro or ortho you'll probably find out over the next few weeks which one it is because mm -hmm. if it gets better well clearly it doesn't matter whether it was ortho or neuro because that's that's what we wanted anyway whereas if it's whereas if you think oh i wonder if this is neuro and you do your hopping and your poor place in your exam and you think mm, i can't tell with that it's as i'm saying to a lot of the vet students it's really reasonable then to say to owners look at my treatment for your dog my my next diagnostic test is 
what do the next four weeks bring us? So I'm going to get you back. We're going to look at your dog exactly the same again. Because actually then it usually becomes very obvious. You know, you say, no, this dog's clearly abnormal. I think that's a really good point to say for actually neurological orthopedic. And let's take this back to owner level, whether this is arthritis mm-hmm. or whether this is more complicated neurological time time it's okay guys and i learned this um probably the hard way because you just want to be right and you want to be quickly right and you want to get things moving in the right direction and you want to be the answer for that owner so they can go home and go i know it's okay i can deal with it sometimes we can't and reassessment is really really important Mm. i don't think it's a vet's fault to say well actually i think there could be pain components so i am going to use non-steroids but we need to Mm -hmm. reassess and see if anything's changed So I think a really important take home from that little sentence is you need to build up a good rapport with your vet and be able to have those honest conversations of I'm not 100 percent sure yet, but give me time, give the dog time and let's look again and see what's changed. And I think a lot of people are quite in fear of doing that, to be honest. I think you're right. I think there's a drive for uh everyone to to feel like they've made the decision that they made a diagnosis sorry and, and given a treatment and i think and i think there's a perception uh that owners will not like it if we don't give a diagnosis and a prognosis but to be honest actually the the point for me of is is giving a prognosis and not necessarily the diagnosis and so that's the and, and because the diagnosis is we just want to be able to tell owners and owners just want to know, I think, what's going to happen next. And so I think it's usually fine to say, look, what I'm pretty sure is not going to happen next is that we're going to find that your dog's got a disease that we could have treated today, but in two weeks we can't treat because those diseases mm-hmm. don't really exist. You know, they're not very common. So often being, there isn't so, or usually a lot of urgency with the cases to, to particularly what like I you've just realized, I just realised a massive difference being first opinion and being specialist that you are. If someone comes to me and I don't have an answer, I say, I don't know, they, they'll go away to their friend and go, that doesn't know anything. If they come in and you say, oh, I don't know, like, oh, it's so complicated, even the specialist didn't know. <laughs> it's so unfair. You know what? It's very true. I think that's, unf- that is, that is, it is, it is, yeah, it's one of those things. But even in a practice, you'll have that. You know, I know when I work with my dad, it would be the same when I graduate, you know, I wouldn't know and ask my dad and my dad wouldn't know. And the owners would be like, oh, well, that's fine. Well, if, Harcourt Brown Senior doesn't know, and it, you know it's fine, isn't it? But it's just that is just one of those things. But it's but I think that the um, I think that the one thing that stuck with me a lot was the fact that uh, some research that I read about GPs and the fact that most people think a successful GP consult was when the doctor could tell them what they came for, which sounded like quite a low bar for me actually. But that was quite a uh, but that was it. Whereas the the GPs thought it was prescribing something, and I, and I remember thinking, reading. I mean, this was back in the nineties, you know. And I, but I do remember thinking that and thinking actually that's really interesting. So it's making sure that you really know what the um, what the signs are, what the worries are that the owners have got. And I think that the what I found very interesting with that one is that particularly with animals who come like freddie might come and the owners are really worried that they're painful it, it's trying to really work out what are they doing or not doing that lets you know that they're painful what are the instances let's, they are... let's, let's play here for a while this is really helpful so because you're, I... so you're sort of saying you know what because I'm, I'm always trying to think well how will i know if i've made this dog better because how can i what am i going to measure here because i think that the the bit hand which you started about with our conversation was people with a that are really worried about their dogs being really painful. So worried they might even be putting their dogs to sleep actually because they're really worried they're painful, particularly because they've given them pain relief drugs and it hasn't made a difference. And so your 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 case that you presented, how do I know if they're painful or not painful? One way is that if you know what behavior it is that you're wanting to change and you give them what we know is an effective pain relief drug like Metacam, for example, Meloxicam, and it makes no difference, it's worth questioning whether they're really painful and that's the point that i said now it might be more complicated there might be types of pain that are not responsive to it but if your dog looks quite cheerful and its mobility is affected but pain relief hasn't made much of a difference i think that it really ex- expanded to me what the differential diagnoses were so by being able to say well actually what is it and i say is it actually limping or does it mind if you touch it and they're like well no what it does is just really slow to rise and it really starts panting as it gets, you know, as it tries to walk up and down the garden. You know, you look at it, well, actually, maybe that dog's, that's just really hard work for that dog and actually can't breathe all that well because it's laryngeal paralysis. Mm-hmm. So 
by digging down into those bits, I think that's what one of the things that's a big difference uh, for us as referral vets versus first opinion vets is that 10 minutes of being able to chat about the history versus an hour of being able to chat is very different or even at, yeah. an hour and a half you know where, where you can actually just sit with people and, and, got talk that. That. and um, the lovely Lynn hopefully will put a um, link to a pdf that we have called um, what has changed for my dog so it's a questionnaire guide mm -hmm. off you can fill it in and you can go with it to your vet and if your vet starts receiving this same questionnaire they get used to it and they'll be able to quickly take data out of it so that consult is going to be more useful to them mm. because you get really pressurized what we can do but i know now that i use the questionnaire i can just grab what i need quite quickly but the owners had an hour before the consult to really get all the detail down so that i can just extrapolate what i need and stick to time and, and I know from I know Han from from looking at vets from the other side of it when they refer stuff to me. I'll know that there are vets that are particularly interested in certain aspects, and I'll know that there are vets that maybe aren't so hot on. They're not. It's not their area. And I'll, I'll often have clients say that their vet didn't seem to care or didn't seem to listen to them. And I think that we all do this when we don't know what to do that we try to blank it out and uh, and and get rid of it and not really listen and so one of the things i'll often say to vets is you know if they're finding that there's a vet that that they don't think is listening to them it might be this is just this isn't the right time for them and their vets and i think all the right condition for them what do you what do you think about that as in i'm sort of i never try and say to someone to change their vet this isn't, isn't what i'm no, saying it's just that there'll be different even in a the practice there'll be different vets there'll be some vets that are really on to it yeah. yeah, we've got to kind of like planning that. First of all, it could be that vets just had a bad day. And mm -hmm. I I try my hardest in every consult. But there's days where things have in the back of your head from the consult before or the one that's just pending and you might not be 100% present. So maybe have a word with the practice, with the reception to say, you know, I didn't feel that I got enough out of that consult. What's the chance of me being able to speak to them again? Can I email them? Can you have a word with them? Then we suggest if you're really not happy, then say, can I see somebody else in the practice? But give them a heads up and say, is it somebody that's interested in chronic disease? Somebody that's interested in pain management? Because as you say, everybody has their area of interest. Because I would take it from very much, my, my mum was a rabbit specialist, you know, and so she was she was very, and so this is probably a, a less contentious area to us, but you'd definitely be in a practice where there'll be vets that really didn't feel that rabbits were their strength and would rather not have to deal with them and there'd, be, you'd, there'd usually be one or two or three vets in a practice who loved rabbits and if you could then sort of get the owners to channel to the rabbit vets then it would work very well yeah. and that, that's sort of what we'd do yeah everybody knows that i'm obsessed about arthritis and yeah. people arthritis cases whereas they won't send me heart cases because i'm mm. like i'm scared of the you know so um so I, guess, I guess when we got to the bit with with freddie haven't we we talked about the fact that we no, no, just finished last oh, bit of advice right yeah. so if they really really feel that they have tried the same vet they've tried seeing a different vet in the same practice and they still feel that they're not getting the service then you are paying for this service you have every right mm. to and go somewhere else or seek a second opinion a lot of people feel it's like your local GP human clinic where you get designated a surgery that you go to for your own health and that's who you should stay with hell or high water Actually, it's not the case in the vet industry you get to choose and now long gone are the days of there being only one vet in the town there's generally quite a few you know so you are allowed to do that but just behave professionally you know pro politely and just move on, take your history, get a second opinion. That is fine. You're allowed to do that. So back to the big golden retreat. Who is that actor? What is his name? Oh, Brian Blessed. Brian. Oh, right, Brian. okay. <laughs> I am. Um, so we were talking, yeah, because you were sort of, I, I sort of gone at it a bit from the vet side. But if you're, if you're the owner, I guess, and you're worried could your is 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 pain the only explanation for your dog signs what are the things that you could look out for i guess we talked about dragging their feet which is always yeah i think, I think we can play with these clinical signs because that's really going off on the questions and we're going to have quite a lot of questions at the end tell them again about dragging scuffing yeah. 
yeah so dragging so dragging a limb is always a neurological sign so 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 the must so if they're dragging the tips their paws the door tips their claws the, the dorsal part of their paw that then that's always a neurological disease you can tell by looking at the nails and looking at the yeah. top of the, if you've got oh yeah definitely nail yeah. Or broken skin or if the top of the nail not the side or the underneath but the top and you can see that they really are not mm. picking <laughs> so that's right and that's and then the other one with these older dogs is particular retriever breeds but it can happen at younger ages and they're really giant breeds like leon burgers but i have to say that most leon burger owners haven't got a leon burger by accident and they're usually quite up on the fact they get neuropathies these these big giant dogs but the big but the labradors the golden retrievers i mean so many golden retrievers that i walk past you'll see them and they've often got this they usually the signs that they're nervous system, their peripheral nerves aren't working well they might drag their limbs they're very slow they'll often lose weight because they need a normal nerve supply to the muscle to maintain their muscle mass so they often got a poor muscle mass and that might doesn't they can be a dog with a lot of fat but actually be quite thin underneath it so you can usually feel that by feeling the bones you know you, there's no real fat over some areas of the bodies, you can usually feel that they're they're thin dogs under the fat. Um, feel like the feral head, feel the femur. You shouldn't be able to feel the femur, guys. Yeah, so if exactly. you put your hand down the side of your dog's legs and you can go, whoa, there's bone there. That's and often on their often on the head, they they they've got a much more sunken appearance. And and the and then um, the other big thing is that we talked about laryngeal paralysis, and that can be the dominant sign. So people go to their vets, their dogs can't breathe. But also, I think it's often quite a secondary sign. It's not that bad. But what you'll hear is the dogs are quite noisy with their breathing. Do so you say that they can their throat more as well? Do, they, do you ever notice they've... <laughs> Oh, they, do you know what? It's a really good question. I don't... I haven't noticed that, but they absolutely could because we do know from some work from a lady called Jen Kins, who was then we know Jahan. So they, as well as having laryngeal paralysis, they, they can't swallow properly either. They're slow with yeah. their swallowing. Um so yeah, they probably will do that. But the other thing you notice is that, that their bark will change. That's really common, and it, and it's some of these dogs don't bark very much, but their bark becomes uh, initially more high pitched, then it can be quite hoarse and just really nothing to it. And often when mm -hmm. I see these owners, I say, "What does their bark sound like?" And they, "Oh yeah, that's a it's different." And they haven't really twigged to link these together. But you can hang. So these this old old Freddie Redmain, this retriever, you know, if he's dragging his legs and his barking isn't working very well um then and he's looking like he's getting retired his breathing's very noisy um these are classic for having a neuropathy these dogs and they because people talk about tails a lot and quite often these dogs you can just see the tails like it's, it's just uh, yeah I, I, with the dog but not propelling the dog it's a secondary movement because of the swaying gait isn't it that's a good point and i wonder that they yeah i a couple of things to say about that one if it i wouldn't want to say that that sort of tail carriage is going to be really consistent with a, a nerve disease because one of the reasons that I, we often see that can be like trap nerves a lumbar sacral disease low down in their back but in an older dog i think you're dead right hannah the difference would be is that probably if you ask those dogs to wag their tail they can so they will lift it like a dog should have I'm not a dog should have its tail coming down with a little curve at the end yeah. so you know every dog should have that little curve when it's hanging down but when so if it points straight to the ground there's usually something wrong with them with their tail carriage that's like having a low head carriage or like really Holy collapsed yeah. With, yeah and it was it was horrible when you saw it just like vertical and it was mm -hmm. like pendulum it just yeah so okay so we've talked about some of the things what about palpation um so a lot of these owners are now sitting at home. They're like, oh, actually, he does, you know, he does clip the tops of his toes. I have heard him scuff his pad. He is a bit draggy. You know, he's slow to get up. Um, what do we do as vets? We're not saying you owners should go and do this. But when you do an exam, just talk to them about what you're examining, examining for. So, so, yeah, so it's a bit like we alluded to before. I, I would be I'd be looking at the dog walking. And just thinking, is it neuro or not? So I'm, I'm I'm looking for these slightly short strides, the fact that it's not limping, the fact that it's got a low head carriage, listen to its listening to its breathing, and then I would the, the key tests are that poor placement test we talked about, and the hopping test that we've got, and then usually the other thing is lying them on their side and 
testing their reflexes and there are quite a few reflexes you can test but there's only a couple that are important and they really are um the patella reflex where you hit them on the knee and they straighten the leg and then the what we call the pedal withdrawal reflex where we pinch the skin between their toes and see how well they pull it back and often with these dogs um they pull it back quite well and if you don't quite know what you're looking for you think oh that's normal so they'll flex their hip because that's quite a big strong muscle and they'll often bend their knee as well they'll flex their knee but the bit they can't do is flex their hock and their digits so the ankle and the toes so those should really curve right up as well towards the leg but they'll often leave them because they can't pull them away from your finger they're quite weak so it, it, it looks like it's intact that reflex but actually it's not that they're, they're starting to lose the ability so i think if you if anyone was paying attention at the beginning i sort of said the longer the nerve is the harder it is to maintain so obviously the longer ones are going right down to the toes so those are the ones that are harder you know if you or i go to have our neuro exam they'll test the strength of your big toe and and stuff like that and we're kind of doing the same sorts of things with with the dogs so that's one but i think um yeah doing a poor placement test and doing their reflex is the really key bit but yeah. i have to say the picture of these dogs is so characteristic with them it's these older sad looking retrievers with their low, sort of low head that have got very short strides that yeah. are um and they're quite noisy with their breathing i have to say the voice change is usually so obvious with them and it's something that people haven't twigged that that's the that's one of the bits that's really can important. we get this in other breeds because people are now going oh okay i haven't got retriever mm. but um i've got a corgi or i've got mm. a coat retriever or whatever do you are you specifically talking about golden retrievers no i think it can happen in in i think it can definitely happen in almost any breed i think that the uh the bigger but it's these sort of like 30 40 kilo dogs that are the that are the ones that i think that we see it more commonly and definitely happen in, in any others i i um if someone described this dog to me and it wasn't a retriever though if i had a vet saying i've got this i think it's got a neuropathy um if it was a 12 year old retriever i might be quite happy not necessarily doing that many more tests mm -hmm. but other dogs i generally would want to do more tests on them and one of the one of the, one for example one of the most common uh causes of this is a tumor of the pancreas so an insulin secreting tumor of the pancreas so that right curve ball in here well that's right so they these so but and that usually gives dogs low blood sugar and low glucose and so definitely it's when i say common i mean if we if i was to see 200 dogs like this one of them might have one of them might have this tumor. it's not it's not it's not common by any so means we're not going to spend too long there just because we'll scare people i no, thought one of the reasons but the, the point i the only point i was going to make with that one is that if you take your dog to uh, and you think it might have a nerve disease and your vet agrees it might do then measuring their glucose is very simple and affecting to do so don't worry any more than that it's actually quite a treatable disease but it's 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 worth just making sure that if you if you and your vet do agree that it could have a an older dog's got a generalized nerve disease testing their glucose is really important so yeah, yeah. That, i don't want to scare i know i don't want to i don't want to scare people i get that uh, yeah but that's probably an easy test to do you know yeah okay so i've got a really important question can the dog mr could he also have pain as well as a neuropathy yes absolutely could do yes although i have to say it's the sensory nerves too so one of the tests that's kind of being uh suggestive for this you could take a skin biopsy and look at the small types of sensory nerve endings in the skin so if you take an area that you know what the normal density is for a dog and you were to take that small biopsy from their toe region and they've got less maybe that would tell you there's this neuropathy and uh, that's an interesting test but one of the things really interesting is that the nerves that they're testing there are often the ones that sense pain and discomfort and i mean everyone will be familiar with old people who will you know carry on walking to the shops with a broken hip you know because they're sort of carrying on doing that and, and i think this is a very analogous disease to like degenerative neuropathy is very common in old people too and i think they may not be able to feel it very well so it's a very good question because actually their ability to sense pain might be diminished as well they might actually have quite an effective analgesic for not being able to feel it feel it so well i don't want to 
get confusing with this one because I'm not saying that it's an excuse not to treat dogs with arthritis who've got this neuropathy. I suppose I've got in my mind the specific picture of an owner who's really worried that their dog's mobility is really bad, but no amount of pain relief seems to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the point of this is to expand the possible explanations to add one to joint disease, which is maybe nerve disease. And that nerve disease then isn't painful, you know, and, it, and is mm -hmm. a reason for it that might not be as worrying. I think it, I think for me, what I'm hoping that's getting across is that it's complicated. Mm -hmm. and I think knowing what I know now, having that good relationship with your vet to be able to sift through this under a number of reassessments is really important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because quite often, as you said, that vet might start off saying, right, I really believe that this is going to be pain related. I've got some behavioral change. I've got um, changes in mobility. This is a breed that I know is going to have, you know, hip problems. I felt that on the examination. So let's start with an anti-inflammatory and then you come back a few weeks later and the picture hasn't improved as much as you want. And at that point, the vet says, well, actually, look at this. We've got some scuffing of the pads. We've got some slow reflexes here. We might have a combination. Is that mm. fair? Are mm. we trying to put people's expectations more than anything? Well, I've just found that when I've had when I've seen people, and this is the diagnosis we've made, it's just that people are usually quite pleased. Because though you're saying to them, look, your older dog is just getting older and it's another bit of their body that's breaking. Um, you're saying to them, they're not painful here. You know, they don't worry too much. About fit. You, you know, yes, just go with the Metacom when they look, when that, that type of arthritis pain that you're familiar with, you know, when they limp on that front leg because their elbow is bad, like it's been for the last six years, give them some Metacom and, and, and let it get better or carry on with your physio for that bit of it or do all things you're doing. But this whole general slowing down, it, it doesn't represent another level of agony that your dog's in. And, and I think that's, that's, that's what's quite nice to be able to get across to them. I think. No, so that's good. So that's definitely covered something that was troubling both you and Nick Jeffries. Nick Jeffries had said, that. Um, what about, let's go to the other extreme. We haven't got a leg dragging dog. Mm. We've got a very, stilted stiff back legged dogs so they're walking along and there's it's just mechanical mm. am i nasty here <laughs> upper mountain urine <laughs> well so the thing about those dogs when you're saying whether they've got a stiff back leg gait so that's something for example we'll often see in pugs or french bulldogs is that the sort of gait that you're your meaning yeah yeah so basically very mechanical it reminds me almost of um star wars the chicken you know they're just walking and they they've got <laughs> the star wars chicken yeah what? there's the, well, the snow scene and there's the chicken the chicken oh, the, okay the tonton thing that he kills and gets inside it that one that's the one yeah looks like a chicken so but they have a very very stilted gait and they are um very stiff with their legs and you go to do like a withdrawal test you pinch the toe but you can feel that they really push against it there isn't the withdrawal there's no reflex there i'm pushing you towards that intervertebral disc disease no well i think it's an interesting one when you're when you're um when you're saying about a stiff behind them gait because what you've mentioned there about disc disease and you said that thing about upper motor neuron which is a term that scares a, and confuse a lot of vets a lot of students we you know try not to use it so much because it is a what we're meaning by that is that if dogs have spinal cord disease in the middle of their back then their back leg muscle tone will just get massively increased often and so mm -hmm. you'll get you you'll find that it's they find it hard to bend their leg particularly with pressure on their pad that causes them to really rigidly straighten it and so you can see that stiff hind limb gait with um, a spinal cord problem, yeah, because they'll they'll be slightly stiffer, the muscle tone will be increased. What I would say, though, is that we do also see it with um, dogs that don't want to bend their legs. So it's either sort of like can't bend and won't bend kind of things, you know, and yeah. they they don't want to because they've got stifle disease or they've got hock disease. Yeah. And so you'll, you'll get that with them too. And so it gets a bit back to what you asked me I mean, you guys are going to know what I do for my job. It's pretty easy. So that dog, I'd look at it, and I think I would then do my reliable tests of just saying, well, is this neuro or not? It's not lame, so it goes to my 
basket where I do a neuro exam and it's that poor placement and hopping that would screen the nervous system for me because without a hopping or a poor placement um, deficit then they're, if so if they're hopping and poor placement response are quite normal it's probably not neuro sometimes those dogs are really useful to video in slow motion so when a dog walks the normal way it coordinates its gait is that it puts its back foot just where its front foot just was so if you walk them through a puddle and then afterwards you see where their footprints are their back paw footprint almost goes in so the on the left side the, the back foot just goes into the footprint of the left foot as it's moving on or the distance between those paw prints is exactly the same every time when they've got a spinal cord problem they can't regulate that distance it's all it's really variable where they place their feet so if you've got a dog that looks like it's walking abnormally you want to know is it making the same mistake every time in which case it's mechanical and orthopedic or is it making a different mistake every time so sometimes videoing them and watching them and saying is it different or the same is is, is really helpful if it's the same mistake every time it's probably a mechanical orthopedic gait abnormality if it's different every time it's probably a neurological one and this is sometimes the only thing you can do with horses for example which is sometimes that we see because you can't hop them or do poor play or pigs we saw very good pig with a muscle disease last week you can't you can't get them to hop or do tests on those you've got to just look at the videos a lot and that, that's something that the um that we look at quite a lot with the the gait analysis what i find very interesting is that owners are almost always right with what they've interpreted and so are vets it's just they're not very good at telling you why that why they have felt that their sort of gut feeling is a sort of unconscious interpretation of what they're seeing so when people say oh look they're all uncoordinated i think it's their back they're usually dead right it's 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 i mean yeah maybe like i don't know 75 percent of the time they'll be right there'll be sometimes people are wrong but generally i think if you if you have a gut feeling that whether your animals got an orthopedic or a neurological is generally people are right or if they think their gait isn't right one thing i would say about all this though i said about pugs and french bulldogs is the problem we've got with a lot of these smaller breeds is their gates aren't right but they're okay like they're not I'm going to ask you about this because it's going to be controversial it's going to upset a few people because when you mentioned about pugs and people are very accepting of certain breeds having really bad gates mm. and is that because we actually have got congenital developmental problems there absolutely so you might see these dogs for example have got some spinal cord compression from a deformed vertebra in their back so by breeding them to have tails that turn in a corkscrew their back is also really bent in the middle and they'll get these vertebrae that are really deformed and they can get quite a bad compression of their spinal cord now the thing about those dogs is that they um it might compress the spinal cord when they're young they might get a bit of uncoordination, but then their body can stabilize it. So it stops there. So that's not perfect. We don't need to do anything about it at that sort of point in time. Another one would be Chihuahuas who, particularly New Yorkies, who will often have their skulls will be too small really for their brain actually and their cerebellums don't quite fit so they get a really uncoordinated gait in their front legs. And so they're okay because they're static. And I think the way to differentiate those gait abnormalities from with ones that you need to do something about from ones that it's okay to just watch it's exactly what you were saying earlier on han about just watching them over time and just repeatedly examining them we're really only worried about things that are getting worse if if they're getting worse please do something because you don't want to suddenly find you make because so if, if an animal has been given a back that's not the right shape you're not going to be able to get it into the right shape with surgery mm -hmm. you're only ever going to be able to hopefully make it a bit better. So if they're managing okay, we leave them well alone. But if they're and getting I think worse, that's really difficult. Like when I see a pug come in and it's lame in its hind legs, and I'm like, oh, goodness, this is not going to be easy because it was already like a weird ataxic gait. Then it's got some orthopedic additional problem on top. You're like, oh, God, this is going to be difficult because the owners are going to not know what's abnormal and not be able to monitor that something's been successful because i think people are more aware of this now though with the breeds i have to say i think having having um gone through at the we were seeing lots of cavalier king charles spaniels when i was training with the this disease called syringomyelia which gave them a lot of neck pain and um was it's a horrible disease and uh there was a big program on 
telly about how bad this was in the breeding. And I think we, I, they've gone from probably my second most common dog that I see to hardly ever seeing any Cavaliers. And I think the same's hap and I think the same's happening with pugs as well. I, I think, and I think the breed registrations for pugs is this. My dad told me this. This is me quoting a probably reliable source that the the breed registration for pugs has gone right down. I do think that there's people that have had pugs and love their pugs a lot, but found it hard to live with all their abnormalities and, well, and might, might not get another, you know, so. Somebody said here, all pugs are deformed and I've got six. I love them all, but would never yeah. have. <laughs> no, that's right. You do get, you know, there are some dogs that you can tell when people get that dog, they're never getting another type of dog. Like Bassets, for example, people always get Bassets. If they've got one Basset, they get loads of Bassets, but, no. you get, but then like, um, but yeah, I, I do. I think pugs are a bit heartbreaking. Actually, I think they get so much wrong with them that they're they're really difficult. So yeah, really difficult. Okay, so mm. there is so much. Like my plan for tonight was, well, it's been blown out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to have to get you back because everybody loves you. everybody thinks you're fab. Um, it would have been nice to kind of like talk about different diseases. But it's quite difficult because there's there's so much to talk about. But what I would like to spend just a little bit of time talking about before we do 10 top tips is lumbosacral disease. Because I feel that we've talked done peripheral neuropathy, we've done a bit about disc disease, but we haven't really talked about lumbosacral. And that does really fit within our remit, which is chronic pain management. And lumbosacral is associated with pain. Help us here. Um yeah. Han, let's do. We should. <laughs> Han, this is a big, big topic. No, this is a good one. So, lumbar sacral disease. Yeah, I would say probably um, our most common referral will be animals that were painful that aren't painful when we see them. The owners are worried, and so those and and lumbar sacral disease and disc disease in general fit hugely into that one. And I mm -hmm. would go the thing i'd say about lumbar sacral disease is that uh i reckon oh, what would i say about it? i was so much mainly around the uncertainty with making the diagnosis even with all the tools we've got with mri and everything i'm i know that there are dogs that look like they should have lumbar sacral disease but they're running around normal i know there are dogs whose back pain's so convincing but we don't find anything on mri i know that the literature in people particularly shows that surgery might not really be that helpful unless you're like a real like nfl football athlete or something but then there's other literature that says that it makes you better quicker and so that we should be operating on dogs more it's a really big topic disc disease and pain particularly low back pain and how to manage it so i think Hannah, i think we should do another one about this i reckon <laughs> i don't think we're going to do it i'm not going to do it in 10 minutes we're going to no. Could yeah. we? Could you just answer whether you're allowed to treat the clinical signs? So if absolutely, you absolutely, completely, yes, definitely, one hundred percent. You have got I, a dog that is showing quite a, a stiff, stilted, protected gait. They've got dorsal pelvic tilting, so they've got a, a bit more of a kyphotic lower back, a drop tail. You can see they're really in the area. I, I tell you, my decision making about those cases with lumbar sacral disease or low back pain is i will operate on dogs that can't walk clearly they that's a, a category that should do dogs that are painful they need to not get better by themselves and that's that so i'm always trying to think well if i'm going to do something it's got to be better than doing nothing and i need to make sure that doing nothing isn't going to cure them and i think with a lot of lumbar sacral disease as we all know from neck or back pain you get really bad episodes and it goes and so, and you might even get a couple of episodes, but they go. And the big thing it strikes me is that people will tolerate pain in themselves, but would not tolerate that in their dogs, you know. Mm -hmm. And But actually, if you can think, oh, hang on, is it just like that, that when I can have a twinge in my back and not want to lift things up for two days? You say, yeah, it's exactly like that. Then they don't want to operate and they're quite happy with their older dogs. They know that that's a consequence of aging. So mm -hmm. you said, can I just treat the signs? Well, absolutely. And I think there are some, there are a couple of, the, the way I would treat uh, looking at back pain, for example, is that um, I'd look at it and think, is there any reason to think it's not a disc problem? And by that, I mean, is there something like a tumor or an infection going on here? And usually some big red flags like weight loss, a high body temperature, 
Now, those are two of the real big ones, maybe drinking more than normal, so suddenly increasing their drinking, or pain that gets worse and worse and just doesn't go away. Those need in, those need investigating. And as a first opinion vet, you know, an older dog with back pain and weight loss, that's one that may well benefit really from an X-ray, you know, because mm-hmm. because you might you don't need an MRI to diagnose an infection in the disc or the bones or the tumor. So that's where your vet might recommend that one. Um, if I think it is a disc, uh, so the dog looks otherwise well, but it's just painful, then absolutely treating the signs just just with whatever degree of exercise management and pain relief you want to give it, that's absolutely fine. But if it's getting worse, then that's another red flag for maybe a different disease. And that's then, and if it's getting worse, not better over a sort of six to eight week period, that's then when it falls into the category for me of thinking it needs surgery. So that's when I'd want to see it because I'd say, well, look, maybe we should operate on this dog now because it's not getting better by itself. The only other red flag with lumbar sacral disease is it's trapping nerves low down in the back. And if it traps nerves to the leg, well, they get lame and they get painful. But if it traps nerves to the bladder and the tail, and they're fecally and urinary incontinent, then those ones probably do need surgery. But I don't think there are many people that leave their dogs fecally and urinary incontinent. Mm-hmm. That, you know, I think that they're, they're, they're that, I mean, people would be knocking on their vet's door to say, please, we should do something more about this. So, yeah. 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 And I definitely think from what I'm learning, so I'm doing a rehab diploma. So I'm really into bringing the physio aspect into the pharmacological aspect. Mm. And, the therapeutic exercise, the controlled exercise, the house adaptions. Um, I think expanding your mind and not just thinking popping a pill is going to be good enough. I think in these cases, combining the heat therapy, the massage, maybe some tens, maybe adding some laser, you know, there is different things that you can do and do speak to your vet and say, I am open to suggestions. Is- well, the thing is, what struck me with working with our rehab department is that I'm always very fixated on the diagnosis to be able to give the prognosis. And sort of so my treatment and my recommendations often hang on giving as accurate a diagnosis as I can. And so it, it blew my mind a bit, really, to work with people who didn't really mind what the diagnosis was. They didn't mind which. And, and actually, I've come to realize it doesn't really matter what the some you want to know it's not diagnoses that are going to progress and need treatment but actually the actual cause precisely of why a dog's back's painful isn't that important if you can get it to a good level of mobility for a long time with rehab and with pain relief i'm so glad that you said that because it's been a complete change of mindset for me and Mm. i sat down with two physios two years ago and i really was hammering out so what what happens if you don't work out what it is and they're like as long as the dog I'm like, I know, and it's it's like what you what, but it's yeah. but I I agree I agree. So I think that the 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 bits that sometimes I can find hard is when um, physios don't appreciate it from the other way around, and they'll they'll say to me, right, I found these things that are important to me as a physio, trigger points, muscle tension here. I think you should MRI there, and I look at this dog in my consult room jumping up at the door and running around, thinking, well, I'm not operating on this dog, wh- whatever I find there. So I don't, and I'm worried if I MRI it, I'll find something that's going to worry the owner and everyone. So I don't want to use my tests like that. But I have to say, most physios, um, either when you know I speak to them and, and and that's all right, or they don't, you know, they they get that world particularly physios that have worked in the nhs where i think it's it's much more developed that relationship between doctors and yeah. and physios with it but we're, we're yeah. um yeah so i think i think that the, the key for me is that it's absolutely fine to manage them like that i think as long as you've got a plan b for when it's not responding and yes. and we go back to that beginning bit of um what is it that the owners are seeing that's really worrying them so if someone's saying look my 10 year old dog can't do you know 15k bike rides with me anymore it, it, you know th- you might not be able to make that better whatever it is but the but the you know i yeah i think that's probably enough to say about that isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think um because i i he was gifted at university very gifted compared to me i managed to coattails <laughs> i try and keep things so blinking simple for myself and with a lot of interventions be it chronic pain chronic disease we don't put enough emphasis on being objective and monitoring and mm. i think we really do as a vet profession need to take this more seriously at the beginning of a, a a complaint a disease process an appearance of clinical signs we should objectively assess them and talk to the owner about what we see what they see so that we can 
follow through with it we can move with it and i just don't oh, it's amazing you get i'll get people come and they've come and you and, and they'll show me a video of what they're worried about and i'll be like oh, that's just fine that's just what dogs do when they're asleep you know like that sort of dreaming bit and they'll be like well that's not that's not a problem no no it's fine and then they just go home and they're fine with it because but no one's actually at that point really been able to draw out what that what that problem is you know and i, I agree really mm -hmm. understanding it and i think as i said earlier what if I'm not sure what to do, as long as I'm convinced the dog's safe, I'll, I'll do nothing. And sometimes my consult's geared around um, just making sure the owners are comfortable with the fact that I'm really thinking about this. I've really got this. And so even though I'm not doing anything except telling them to see them again in a, in a bit of time, that this is a treatment. This is, I mean, this is a test that we're, that we're doing on their, on their dog to give it time. And I think that's, um, I think a lot of vets do that. A lot of vets do that naturally. It's just harder and, 10 minutes to communicate that bit it's so and, it's, and and hard without the when you when if you've got lots of trust you've seen that vet all your life you know you trust them but i particularly feel for new graduates let's say that go to work in a city in a practice with lots of vets and see different clients and see different vets all the time i mean i it was easier work for me working for my parents and i'd see clients that i had known for you know 20 years that would would come in it's a different level of trust that's and it's hard to get you know and i think um I usually say to people, you know, find the vet that you like and just stick with them and make sure you ask to see them every time. It's amazing how many vet people will say, oh, I see a different vet every time. And you say, well, have you asked to see that vet then that you like? And they say, no, no, I think I get what I'm given. And having worked in a practice like that, you realise actually that if they just say, I want to see them, you see, you see them, you know. I know. And that's so, it's so obvious when you say it like that. Mm. And I think there's also a generation of people that really feel that they should only see the vet that's been allocated to them. I think maybe the younger generation are a bit more demanding and saying, no, I do want to see the vet that I've been seeing mm. case. Whereas I know that my mum and dad, I'm going to call them the other generation, they would just, <laughs> would just put up and see, sorry, mum and dad, <laughs> but they would just say what they're given. And mm. um, time, let's see if we can do a couple of questions and then we'll do a 10 to do there's so much love for you here it's amazing like <laughs> so amazing i've had somebody tell me that i've got a really annoying voice which is really pleasant so thank oh, you oh i had that do you know what i did a lecture in america and that the only feedback i got was that the speaker's boring and monotonous voice sent me to sleep that was it <laughs> i love it so it was a good, really good massive conference that was it that's all they said yay yeah. yeah well i've just had that tonight so that's nice thank you um Okay, this is a totally on the spot. Would you recommend supplements? What's your supplements? Uh, I, I assume we're meaning for ah. Would you recommend any supplements for a ten-year-old border collie? I can't think of any that I would necessarily recommend. That would depend a lot on what you were trying to address with the supplements. I'm assuming you might mean joint supplements for that. Now that's, that's a whole level of. Um, evidence-based medicine that i i i don't know if you think they've worked they've worked so give them would be what i'd say but if you don't think they're working don't bother with them that's kind of where i would feel with with that one because i think there are it depends so much there is an evidence base there is some research to support some of the supplements um and there's then people that use that evidence base to support their supplement that isn't the same supplement. So they're all, so it's quite, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a funny little world, this one. And um, particularly one of the supplements I'll see a lot is CBD oil, for example, with dogs with epilepsy, which may actually have an evidence base. But the problem is, is that the strength and the formulation of the CBD oil is so varied. You've no idea what you, what you, giving or what what they're getting which is really disappointing i think somewhere like california where i think they're trying to make medicinal standard ones is probably going to lead the way a bit with with that i mean that's really off topic but yeah hard question no, no, to no, answer, but... it's massive in oa it's massive in oa and mm. it's kind of that you've said that because we always just look like the the party poopers when we say well the evidence is still quite quite poor and the problem is the, the majority you know the minority have ruined it for the majority and that there's loads of people out there getting on the back of selling this stuff they don't care what they're selling they don't have any pride in their concentration and quality and there's a lot of fake out there you know they did a um, a review and there was one product on the high street that was something like 90 pounds a pot and it had no cbd in it you know 
and I think it's often, one of the problems, really hard. and one of the problems we have too, particularly as a teaching hospital, I find this one hard, is that the 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 veterinary medicines director at the VMD have said that we shouldn't. There's, there's no licensed product or formulation for any species for CBD, and so we can't be um, prescribing it or dispensing it, and and so and. No one else apart from vets is allowed to prescribe or dispense treatment for animals. So people that are selling CBD oil for animals technically aren't really meant to be doing it. Now, having said all this, I've never seen it be harmful. So I'm like, I, and it, whatever. There was if it, something in the news in the last couple of weeks where there was an uh, adverse skin reaction and a dog's pads sloughed, but that is like one in hundred. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I think. I think only thing that changed in that dog's life in the preceding few weeks that is the only thing that they can link to but it was just one case study that hit vet press so i think it's a, so it's, it's not something i ever prescribe but if someone phones me up to tell me their dog's epilepsy is loads better on it then i i'm just happy for them to be fair so the uh, you know um but yes yeah, so the supplements yes that's a yeah it's an interesting question that one so a bit of a minefield that one i think yeah i'm yeah. just going just again loads of love for you which is lovely lovely um do you think laryngeal paralysis can be caused with collar leash ah oh, no no it shouldn't be it, i mean it, it, it no i'd go so far as to say it, it probably it absolutely can't be now so your recurrent laryngeal nerve um go, as it goes up the neck sits right next to the trachea on either side and is a bit actually above it and towards the muscle neck so if you were squashing on the um on the neck with a lead and a collar you wouldn't be able to compress that nerve without probably like asphyxiating the dog so it couldn't breathe so um yeah you, Even you, with sharp, sharp, you know when you see you, people that do a proper recoil you might back. bruise the larynx and change the dog's bark and breathing through like direct damage to the larynx but you won't you won't do it on the lead now i wonder if that person's asking could chronic low grade trauma be what's underlying the neuropathy and that's yeah. an interesting one because i think that people did used to think that one but i think the evidence is that that recurrent laryngeal nerve because it's such a long nerve is kind of like a sentinel for all the other nerves in the body so the more we've looked the more you find that actually oh hang on look their esophagus doesn't work they don't swallow properly oh look their limbs their reflexes are slower if we measure their nerve conduction electrically actually it's slower than it should be so it's not just the nerve that could be damaged by the collar it's all the nerves so it can't be associated with that yeah love it that's a very good one um it's just so much love this is almost sick <laughs> I can't. I can't see it. I'm not in there. And it's you're like, going to go home and go. I need to get a Facebook account so I can just see how much people love. <laughs> um, now I think I think that's most of it. I'll pick up the rest later this evening. So let's do our ten top tips, okay? So Tom was like, "What is this about?" Yeah. I was trying to make sure that anybody of any background with any financial availability can do good stuff for their dog. Um, I'm not ashamed to say I grew up with a family that had a Labrador. We didn't have a lot of money. You know, my dad was bringing up four kids. We weren't able to throw the world at this dog. It didn't mean we didn't love it. So what sorts of things make a big difference in managing a dog with OA? And I'm going to start with number 10 and it's nine, eight, seven, six. So number 10, I love flooring. I love talking about flooring. More rugs, less drugs. These dogs that really are beginning to have problems with getting up from the floor, they need traction. For those dogs that aren't so steady on their back legs, they're sore, they're walking on tender hooks, they need traction. So think about putting rugs down. Number nine. I think probably trying to maintain a tolerable level of activity for them is really important. So trying to not go beyond what they want to do but also trying to keep them doing a good level that is mentally stimulating for them too. So not just the same walk around the block, but trying to give them stuff that motivates them and being interested. It's kind of hard because you want to kind of, I feel like you want to walk them for five minutes less than they, there was, than was bad for them, but you don't quite know where you're at with. It's you know, really you hard. Them. We've got so a new you, exercise tool coming out soon. Just trying to help people question themselves in a flow diagram of, what kind of exercise should I be doing with my dog? Because my dog's different to my neighbor's dog, who's different to the dog that you know Tom saw last week. Dogs are all very different. So when people say little and often, it's very vague, but we've got a new thing, so fingers crossed. 
Number eight is the common one. Wait, wait, wait. And I've just done five or six days of tips for guys about trying to keep your dog's weight under control because we know it has a massive impact on this disease and also it has a massive impact on other diseases. So it's a no brainer. Number seven. So now this one, I'm going to ask you about Han a bit because I I'm, I don't want to make sure that I'm going to get the wrong end of the stick on this. But my feeling was always to try to use as few drugs as possible and use them when you need them. And I kind of felt that the evidence for using things like non-steroidals like Metacam continually was based on research done by the people that made it. So I couldn't really see that they were going to find not to use it very much. But so I would always be testing how much they need it because given the fact that um, one of the problems with arthritis is that when you get any trauma to the joint, it can't clear the inflammation inside it very well. But once it's cleared, it can be quite settled down. The URI, it's pretty unlikely the URI would just blanketly take ibuprofen no, we every day. And I, I think you've got a really interesting point, and it goes back to being objective again, in that I think there are problems on both sides of the consult room table where vets are too scared to take them off the medication for upsetting the apple cart and disappointing the owner and leaving a, a disgruntled owner and owners are too scared to come off of them because it's pain and you know we just really we never want their dog to be in pain so both parties are almost backed into the corner of keeping these dogs on long-term non-steroidals now if i'm going to be really blunt about it another big problem is owners that don't adapt lifestyle they don't get the weight off they continue doing the things that aggravate that disease so that's a big reason that we don't get them off the non -steroidals. And another one, sorry, owners, you're not going to like me, is you come in too late. You come in way late. So these dogs are centrally sensitized. They're very painful. And actually, they do need to be on long-term non -steroidals because we just don't get control of the pain by that point. So if we could work as a team, identify it earlier, be not scared of seeing your vet, see the same vet, attend to it quicker so that we can use it in a more transient way great but unfortunately being brought in late not willing to change lifestyle not willing to get the weight off we're kind of backed into that corner hmm. so you're theoretically right you are theoretically right but i think there's too many things set against that we need to change our consult system we need to have owners that come in with questionnaires that are willing to use objective monitoring and presence they're not so Anybody listening to this, use objective monitoring and you'll find all the tools on our website. Good one there, Tom. <laughs> number, number six, use objective monitoring because it's really effective at trying to get your dog less reliant on long-term non steroidals and adjunct medication. So please go to our website. I'm sure the lovely Lynn will put some links up so that people can actually learn how to monitor because yes, arthritis spikes and then it comes back to baseline and it spikes and it comes back to baseline. Theoretically, you can treat the spikes and you can keep them happy in the, in the baseline. Number five. Oh, that was, uh, that was your one. Was it? Fine. Number for your objective measure. Number five. Um, my experience was just particularly being sensitive to what triggers them to have spikes like being cold or the time of day or when they are and so in trying to uh, yes adapt your life around that so i had an old lurcher who was particularly bad at starting on a cold morning so being able to get him with neck pain so getting him to wear a warm beanie on his neck before we took him out for what would make a big difference to him oh can i do a plug we um are so yeah. okay so in the shop, there is a, um, a, a snug, what's it called, a, um, for a dog. Um, it's like a scarf made by a company called Back on Track. They designed it for Holly, my dog, who sadly passed, because I said, I've got this wonderful coat from you, but my dog's got cervical disc disease, and she walks around with quite a hunched neck, and you can see days where she doesn't really want to turn her head around. And, she and they, um, they designed it and it's now in the shop. So if you're looking for a super, super insulated neck scarf for your dog, it's in our shop. <laughs> <laughs> Number four for me is look at what you have to do with your dog in the day and maximize it. So quite often people feed in a bowl, done. 
well, whoever said all dogs must be fed in the bowl? You can use that food in different ways. You can use it in interactive toys. You can put it and scatter feed it. You can hide and seek it because arthritis needs to be moving. It's a disease that wants to be kept moving and leaving your dog sedentary in its bed. They're not a teenager. They don't need to stay in bed all day and watch TV. They need to be up and moving. So do get them up and moving and use the food ration that you were going to give in a bowl and be creative with it. Number three. Yeah, I'd follow on from what you're you're saying there, Hannah. I, I, I think that one of the um, most enjoyable bits about having a dog is being able to do stuff with them. And I think it's really hard when they're arthritic that that bond that you probably had centred around walking them is kind of gone. And so I think their lives can get quite um, narrow, these older dogs. And so finding something else they can do, and I think the feeding tip's one really good one. But then other things like uh, scent training, for example, where they're, you're able to teach them to be more active is really good and fits with the i mean it, you, you, everyone wants that bond you've got a dog for a reason because you want to enjoy being with it and doing stuff with it and being able, and i found it really enjoyable with dogs to be able to find something that they really like that isn't just walking them for ages and and do it with them and and, and reward them so i think trying to think find that sort of extra thing is really good and i would recommend with that one not worrying too much about it apart from just looking and seeing who's local that does stuff because i mean like you you know you don't have to it doesn't have to be the thing you want you just don't want to travel miles for it so yeah i love that and that's something else we're up to and um, i'll give them a little big up not that we started working with them but there's a there's a company called wow dog biscuits and um it's a british company and it's all homemade biscuits and it's all got good manufacturing process and they use um, the leftovers from brew dog, not that I'm wanting a back door into brew dog, to create these dog biscuits. And we're going to hopefully team up with them and um, have the biscuits in our shop, but they always have a game attached to them. So every time people buy these biscuits, there's a QR code and it's going to be a game that you can do an activity, which we think is oh, it's, wow. Good fingers one. crossed. Fingers crossed. Um, number two for me. Car travel. I know this is a daft one, but I find it really sad. You know, we're sat comfortably in our car, you know, in these seats that are nice and comfortable. We've got our little, you know, seat belt across us. And it's all molded around us. And we can take all the turns and the brakes and hardly feel it. When they're in the back of the car and they're rattling around and they've got nothing to lay down and kind of snug into and brace. If you've got painful parts of your body, be it your joints or be it secondaries, muscle pain, back pain, neck pain, that can be a really unpleasant experience because you have no idea when it's going to happen. And I've heard of a lot of dogs that find going in the car stressful. They become anxious about it. Going to the vet becomes stressful. Going on holiday is stressful. And it's because the dog's going, this really hurts. I'm really not enjoying this. So think about making your cars, if you take your dog to the park or wherever, make them comfortable. Good bedding. And make sure there's some brace so they can lean in and brace themselves against corners. Number one for you, the biggie. I think the problem is we've covered most of these, Han, that we've got here. And I think um, I, apart from weight loss activity and the, I suppose the, the main thing that I would want is to keep challenging the idea about the, diagnosis that if they're getting worse that you as we're hitting back to what we talked about earlier with the vets that you'd build up a good rapport with your vet or if you can your rehab physio person to really just keep thinking and is there something else that's going on here you know is are we right to make this assumption because like I talked to you about the fact that we might not need to know the cause if things are improving or staying static or very slowly progressing, but if things are getting worse, just always reconsidering expanding that differential list to just being above just being pain. That's kind of the mm. biggest tip that I wanted to come on with tonight. Did you have another one for number one? Hun? No, no, I, yeah, dude, I've been doing this for about three years now. I am just the encyclopedia of tips. <laughs> you are. <laughs> Look, dude, I think, like, I love you to bits. I loved you at uni. I think you're fab. You know, you're so lovely, calm, engaging. You're not at all boring and dull. Like, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Your dulcet tones are lovely. Oh, um, good. We would love to have you back. Can we get you back for lumbosacral disease? Oh, yeah, definitely. No problem. Yes. Okay. I'm going to hold you to that. Now, I've and got just noticed, Han, in this yes. feed, I found how to see the comments. So 
there's a lovely lady called Mima Olsen in the comments who used to basically bought me up when my parents were working. She'd look after me and she worked for my parents' practice. So she's been like a mole in the discussion she's board here, here saying she how, uh, <laughs> yeah, saying, so she's been like giving, yeah, so, no, so hi, Mima, if you're still there. Nice to see she, you. I thought she was your biggest fan. It was she like is. a <laughs> I used to watch her feeding red-tailed hawks stuffed in bins at the practice or macaws. Wow. Or she's yeah, she's a very talented lady. So yeah. Perfect. So anyway, yeah, I'd be I'd be very happy to come back. Very happy to come. Thank back. you so much. It's been great. Um, just that you all know, you are um preceding Duncan Lascelles tomorrow, no less. Mm. Hopefully you can follow us. I'm going to see you again tomorrow. I'll make sure I'll leave my squeaky, annoying voice at home. And I'll be <laughs> here with Duncan Lascelles, who is a globally respected yeah. OA specialist. So till then, we'll see you tomorrow.